Back in 2015, I had the opportunity to meet Bjorn Sternberg and Louis Jans von Rensberg, who were two students at Sydney University who lived in Sydney University housing. And while they were there, they undertook an ambitious project to install 30 kilowatts of solar and 42 kilowatt hours of battery on their Sydney University housing that was called Stuco. And that was the first multi-tenant dwelling in Australia to have solar and batteries feeding into the individual apartments. And it was actually providing 80% of the total energy requirements for the students living in that student accommodation. Now, Bjorn is one of the people that we really need, uh, the type of person that we need in Australia as we move into the energy transition. A highly intelligent physicist who goes on to uh, also lecture at Macquarie University, uh, be a startup entrepreneur, sell a company, move to ANU and become a senior research fellow, leading the, the charge in vehicle to grid and how electric vehicles can stabilise the grid in the future. A wild new global warming scheme. Now, uh, you know, the only thing about this one is that it punishes people silly enough and vain enough to think they're saving the planet by buying an electric car. It's a scheme that's generated headlines like this. Could electric cars help prevent blackouts? Now, what's caused this excitement is a paper this week by an Australian National University team of academics. Now, their plan is fiendishly simple. How about saving our electricity system from blackouts by stealing the power in people's EV batteries, the batteries of their electric cars? <laughs> Let's steal that power from the batteries of electric cars exactly when there's some kind of calamity, you know, a big storm may be, there's knockdown power lines, destabilise the system, or maybe a bushfire that you might actually be desperate to flee, you jump in your electric car and... Now, Andrew Bolt, very entertaining, he's got a lot of charisma, but sometimes he just gets on the wrong side of an argument, and this is one of those times. Andrew Bolt, let's call him a boomer. Bjorn Sternberg, let's call him a millennial. Now, I'll bring the Gen X perspective. I was fortunate enough to be at university in... 1993 when the internet started to arrive and I think what we're seeing with the energy transition is exactly the same thing that we saw with the transition to the internet that started at that point in time. Now this ANU study is based on a test when storms knocked down power lines in Victoria early this year. Wind farms also went offline. The system couldn't handle all the yo-yoing and shut down parts of Melbourne. But up in Canberra, 16 electric cars tried to do their little bit to help. And showed how a fleet of just 16 EVs charging across Canberra was able to rebalance the power during a major blackout in Melbourne earlier this year. But such engineering ignorance is many people these days cheering for an electricity system that's totally powered by wind and solar. They don't know how impossible that is either. Anyway, the lead author of that ANU paper is Dr Bjorn Sternberg. Um, and he said, well, actually, no, these cars didn't produce that much electricity at all. But, you know, he has ways of turning this little success into making a real difference. We had 16 electric vehicles plugged into the grid here in Canberra in offices or in garages of the ACT government. They noticed this drop in power supply and within seconds started to discharge power to the grid. Um, and now as only 16 vehicles, they provided a very modest amount of that power that needed to be found to rebalance the exit of the coal plant. But it's a sign of the future when we'll have many more electric vehicles that can do this. In fact, his paper says that if we will get 105,000 more of these cars responding in this way, that would fully cover the backup required for the whole of the ACT and New South Wales for a short burst. Now, at the moment, only Japanese EVs can put electricity back into the system, but Sternberg reckons this will actually, returning the power, will become a standard feature to save an electricity system here that's already so shonky. So, intriguing scheme. It is an intriguing scheme, and uh, what we're going to do is we're going to actually use an argument from analogy. 
That's a special type of inductive argument where perceived similarities are used as a basis to infer some further similarity. And the analogy that we're going to use is the internet and the future energy network equivalent. So here we can see uh, that people are quite comfortable with a computer. A computer makes data. Now, we also have a solar panel, and a solar panel makes energy. Now, if you're familiar with a computer hard drive, that's something that stores data locally. And a battery or an electric vehicle with a battery is somewhere that you actually could store energy locally. Next, most people have a modem and a router if they're watching YouTube videos of Andrew Bolt. And the equivalent in the energy universe is an inverter. Next, you use an internet service provider who bills you for the data that you, you use. And then, the, in the same way, your energy retailer bills you for energy. Now, a data center is off-site data storage. And a community battery can be considered off-site energy storage. Telcos are companies that run and maintain data cables. And grid companies run and maintain electricity cables. Now, this next one is probably the most important, and it's probably the one where people such as Andrew Bolt lose comprehension. P2P file sharing. Well, you might remember companies such as Napster, then Kazaa, who were the first P2P file sharing companies. And then after that, we moved on to torrents, or BitTorrent might be an application that you might have heard of. And this was an effective technology that allowed people to download entire movies over the internet for the first time. And the way that this was achieved was by finding multiple hosts on the internet and downloading parts of that file from multiple different computers and then reassembling it on your own computer. Now, this is the most important concept to understand and in the analogy to draw the comparison with virtual power plants or vehicle to grid such as the trial that Bjorn Sternberg was using uh, 16 vehicles to achieve down in the ACT. Now the next thing beyond that that we haven't covered yet is that we had the rise of social media on the internet and what that allowed you to do is share data with your friends and in the future, we'll also have social energy apps, which allow you to share energy with your friends. The other thing that we should point out is that we're talking about smart networks. And if there is any disaster in a network such as the internet, it actually was designed with the resilience originally to withstand a nuclear war and still have computers being able to speak with each other post a nuclear event until you apply this to the real world. I mean, say there are huge bushfires and they knock out the electricity lines. Your EV, which you were charging at home, is suddenly drained to save the electricity system. And then the fires approach. What are you going to drive? <laughs> this one's actually quite funny. Uh, in any smart network, basically, if you were in an area that was being affected by, say, a bushfire, the network would be smart enough to not actually discharge batteries in electric vehicles in that particular part of the network. And remember, you would still have a level of control on your mobile phone over whether you wanted to participate in one of these virtual power plant arrangements. But the thing that's still being missed here is that the internet itself was an incredibly resilient network and the future energy network is going to be an even more resilient energy network than the one that we have at the moment, where, for example, uh, if you fire a missile into a coal fire power station, you actually take out the electricity grid entirely because that was a single point of failure. And whose car is this really? Is it yours or for the governments to pilfer? And what next? You know, do they go around with the petrol cars next, siphoning the fuels from the tank while you're asleep? Come on, Andrew, you can do better than that. 
Um, we're going to give you a, a quick class on incentives. Now, remember, no one is going to allow any of the energy to be sucked out of their electric vehicle unless they're being paid for it. And uh, let's just give you an idea. Uh, at the moment, if you have a solar system and you send some electricity back into the grid from that solar system, you might get paid seven cents a kilowatt hour. But if it's an emergency and you're selling power out of your electric vehicle, maybe you're going to be charging two dollars per kilowatt hour or more. And that's in an electric vehicle that might have a 400 kilowatt hour or in the future, a 600 kilowatt hour battery. I mean, there's got to be an easier way to deal with our failing power system, surely. Mm -hmm.